Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another SRP Lunchtime webinar. My name is Sarah Hunak and I'm the current chair of the SRP Webinar Committee and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar in partnership with AURPO on safeguards reporting under the Nuclear Safeguards EU Exit Regulations 2019. I'll just quickly go over the ground rules again for you. As always, you can ask questions at any point through the Q&A box, which should be an icon on your screen in the top right corner. Within that box, you'll also be able to see the questions of other people that they've asked as well. And if there are any that you would also like to know the answer to, you can like them. And at the end, time permitting, we'll pose as many of the questions to the speaker as we can, starting with the most liked. Any that we don't get time to answer today will be posted to our events page. As usual with these webinars, you can use your attendance to count towards CPD. So if you email the code on the screen now um, to admin at srpuk.org, then that will register your attendance and you'll receive an email after the webinar to claim your CPD points. Uh, finally, feedback. I know I keep going on about this, but it is really important that we get your feedback so we know how we're doing with these webinars. So please fill in the survey link that you'll be sent after the webinar to let us know how we're doing. Um, as always, I've got to plug the membership. If you're not already a member, then these are the benefits that you could be getting if you were a member. You'll get the Society Journal, weekly e-newsletter and discounts for attendance to any of our paid events, uh, as well as keeping up to date with radiation protection and you'll get hold of job vacancies, things like that. So pop over to our website after the webinar to sign up if you'd like to do that. We also offer three levels of professional registration. Uh, so if you go to our YouTube channel, there are some videos on there where they'll describe what they are and exactly how you can apply for them. So enough speaker for today. I'll hand over to Professor Pete Cole, who is an SRP past president and current president of AURPO. Over to you, Pete. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, welcome, everybody, one and all, to another uh, lunchtime training uh, webinar brought to you by SRP and AURPO. And it is my pleasure and my honour today to introduce today's speaker. Marie Richo is the site lead for the qualifying nuclear facilities with limited operation for ONR. Marie has worked in the nuclear industry for 24 years, joining as a registry clerk with AEA Technology, moving to UK AEA to work with the Government's Directorate of Civil Nuclear Security as the registry officer, PA to the director and office manager. This enabled her to work on a number of projects, including transition of staff into the Department of Trade and Industry and then the Health and Safety Executive. In 2005, she was involved in setting up ONR's Cheltenham office in a technical administrative role until 2014, when she became a safeguards officer in the safeguards team. At the end of 2018, after four years working with a number of colleagues within that team, Marie was asked to take over the role as a site lead for qualifying nuclear facilities, which included, or which includes, over 100 operators in preparation for when the ONR became the safeguards regulator under the Nuclear Safeguards EU Exit Regulations 2019. Marie is now a safeguards inspector for the Office of Nuclear Regulation and which has a responsibility for leading regulation in the UK civil nuclear industry since January 2021. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Marie. Thank you, Pete, for the introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'll just pull up my slides if you bear with me for a second. That should now show you the first slide. So basically this is an introduction to safeguards regulation of qualifying nuclear facilities with limited operation. Um, further on throughout this presentation I will call them QN flows because as you can probably tell that's a mouthful. Um, so the first slide is just a summary to take us through an overview of the ONR purposes, what are nuclear safeguards, the UK safeguards le legislation and regulation, the nuclear operators within the UK, and what nuclear, sorry, qualified nuclear facilities with limited operation are, 
the application for Regulation 31 regime, which is something that's been foremost uh, for the last few months, and then the Accountancy and Control Plans, abbreviated to ACP. So without further ado, um, we'll give you an overview um, on our organisation. So basically, UK legislation sets out ONR's five purposes, of which safeguards is one. We also have nuclear safety, security, the transport of radioactive material and conventional health and safety on nuclear sites. ONR safeguards purposes are defined in UK law, ensuring compliance with safeguards regulations and ensuring compliance by the UK or enabling or facilitating compliance with a relevant international agreement and the developments of any future obligations related to nuclear safeguards. And within these slides, you will find uh, they will be published later on and there are links to relevant frameworks and guidance throughout. So what are nuclear safeguards? So our safeguards are measures to verify that countries comply with their international obligations not to use nuclear materials for civil nuclear programs for non-peaceful purposes. So qualified nuclear materials are defined in the Nuclear Safeguards Act 2018 and regulations as the following. So you've got uranium metal alloy or compound, thorium metal alloy or compound, or containing a substance from which a source material is capable of being derived, plutonium-239 or uranium-233. And a fundamental principle of the safeguards regime is that the verification is independent of the country and is performed by the international inspectorates, i.e. International Atomic Energy Agency. Now, UK safeguards legislation and regulation. Now, of course, with Brexit, ONR became responsible for UK nuclear safeguards regulation reporting against the Nuclear Safeguards Act 2018 and the Nuclear Safeguards EU Exit Regulations, or fondly known as NSR 19. That responsibility commenced on the 31st of December 2020 at 2300 hours um, at the end of the transition period. Now, ONR's role is the UK State Regulatory Authority, so SRA, and manage the UK Systems of Accountancy and Control, the SSAC. Nuclear operators within the UK. Um, now, obviously, there are a large number of nuclear facilities that store, process or produce nuclear materials. These are often termed as duty holders by our other purposes or in our safety and security. But in fact, we also call ours operators within the safeguards remit, as defined by the Nuclear Safeguards EU Exit Regulation, so NSR 19. And the operator is a person or undertaking setting up, operating, closing down or decommissioning a qualifying nuclear facility for the production, processing, storage, handling, disposal or other use of qualifying nuclear material. We've got two main types of UK nuclear facilities or operators. So operators of facilities which hold significant quantities of nuclear material. Um, listed below, we've got power generating and research nuclear reactors, enrichment facilities, nuclear fuel fabrication plants. And then we also have qualified nuclear facilities with limited operation, which is where I sort of oversee. Um, and they are defined by NSR 19. So they're normally universities with nuclear material, technology companies with calibration sources, industrial radiography, NDT, that type of facility. So QNF flow, so Q, QM flows benefit from a regime of limited reporting under Regulation 31, and they were able to apply for this regime of limited reporting under that regulation. Now, if you don't apply, you are obliged to report fully, and this is something that's been prevalent over the last couple of months. Um, the applications that we've received were quite small at first, but we've had an influx, and now we've actually got 83 that have been approved. And um, going forward, hopefully, we'll have another sort of 20 before the Christmas break. So that's that's a good good sort of figure. So applications for Regulation 31. Um, now, following the same guidance, procedures 
and processes, they must comply with NSR 19 as the operators of the facilities which hold significantly larger quantities of nuclear material. The main differences, though, are that they do hold smaller amounts of qualified nuclear material. They cover a wide variety of industries, as mentioned before, NDT research, educational and disposal. Their qualifying nuclear material is usually a small percentage of the business. So in other words, it's something that's not necessarily um, as higher on their priority risk. They have limited resource available to carry out their nuclear materials accountancy reporting. And therefore, we in the safeguards team at ONR have to be proportionate and have proportionate oversight of their regulatory compliance on a case by case basis. Eligible, eligibility, sorry, I always get that one wrong. Eligibility for Regulation 31 regime. Now, this is actually an extract from that regulation, um, and it states that operators of qualified nuclear facilities with limited operation may apply for Regulation 31. And this is clarified in Regulation 2, where a definition of qualified nuclear facilities with limited operation is given. And so basically that means in which less than one effective kilogram of qualifying nuclear material is produced, processed, stored, handled, disposed of or otherwise used, and which is not a reactor, a critical facility, a conversion plant, a fabrication plant, a reprocessing plant, an isotopic separation plant, nor a separate storage installation. Again, this is an extract from the regulations and it refers to the Nuclear Safeguards Act 2018. Again, the definition of what nuclear qualified nuclear material is um, and the fact that we cover fissionable material specified in regulations under Section 8. Source material in the form of, and you've got uranium metal alloy or compound, thorium metal alloy or compound and or containing a substance from which a source material falling within paragraph B is capable of being derived. Within the nuclear safeguards EU exit regulations, there are further definitions of fissionable material as per regulation two below. And again, I won't cover those because we've already done that, um, but you'll be able to see that and obviously the link to those relevant regulations later on in the presentation when it's on the website. This table we found um, very good as part of our application process for the Reg 31s because it defines whether or not the um, qualifying nuclear facility has higher or lower than an effective kilogram. Uh, at the moment, if they have higher than an effective kilogram, they continue to stay at qualifying nuclear facility and report monthly and follow all the regulations within NSR 19. If they have lower than an effective kilogram, they are then acceptable and granted Regulation 31 status. Um, but we use this as part of the application process. So the application for the Regulation 31 regime, there's no de minimis, and that's something that I don't know um, where it's come from, but we have had people come forward saying, well, we've only got a few grams, therefore we don't have to report to you. Um, that's not the case. There is no de minimis of quantity of qualifying nuclear material. If you have any qualifying nuclear material, you should therefore report under either Regulation 31 or NSR 19. You may apply to be a qualifying nuclear facility under this regime by sending to ONR through our UKSO account, um, which is the UK Safeguards Office account. The application form set out at part 11 of Schedule 1, a basic technical characteristics or BTC of the qualifying nuclear facility with limited operation using a questionnaire set out in section I to H of part 1 of Schedule 1 and an initial stock list of your qualifying nuclear material by category. We will then respond within 60 days of this, um, process your application, and normally you will receive a receipt just to say that we've actually had the documents through, but within 60 days you would normally have your formal letter either granting you regime status or explaining why we've not been able to do that, i.e. you have more than an effective kilogram of material. 
As stated by Regulation 31, operators will be given an official letter outlining that reporting regime and any specific caveats from ONR. At the moment, we haven't got any as such that have gone forward on the 80 or so that we've already approved. Um, this would normally cover things like you carrying out your pill or MBR at a different time period to others, but the majority of those will be coming in in January of each year. What we've done is provided an example of those forms. So these, this is an extract from the regulations just to make it a bit more clearer, but this is the information that you would have to provide to us. Um, and for those of you that are already safeguards reporting and have been previously under other regulations, you'll recognise the questions that are in this form. The only thing that we need you to expand on now is the questions 10 and 11. Um, it gives us better oversight and tells us more of a story if you provide as much information in there as possible at the moment. Part 11 form again, you should be fairly familiar with the terminology. Uh, within this document, but we're always here if you have any questions um, or not too sure. It's probably best if you ask the question first rather than submit the form um, with incorrect details. And again, we've listed example of an LII or physical inventory listing. So a list of inventory items. Um, this then gives us your starting balance of what we perceive your pill should be next year or when you submit your physical inventory listing or material balance report once you're allocated onto the regime and granted that. So your obligations as a qualified nuclear facility with limited operation. So as an operator which is permitted to comply within the regime of limited operation, you must inform ONR of a change in basic technical characteristics of the qualified nuclear facility within the period of 30 days beginning with the day in which the change is completed. So in other words, if you have a change of responsibility um, or, for example, you may decide that your storage area isn't appropriate and therefore you're moving your material, it would be advisable for us you to notify us. You should take a physical inventory of qualifying nuclear material in the qualifying nuclear facility in each calendar year, beginning on the 1st of January with the period between two successive physical inventories takings not exceeding 14 months and inform the ONR of the results of this inventory within a period of 30 days on which it is taken in the form specified by ONR um, to the operator in writing. And that again is normally through the UK SO account and you should inform ONR of any change to your inventory of qualified nuclear material according to the format and within the timescale specified by ONR to the operator in writing. And again, this should be sent through the UKSO account. So your annual reporting, you would find the relevant information at of the physical inventory listing at Schedule 1 Part 4 and the material balance report known as MBR at Schedule 1 Part 3. Accountancy and control plan, that's going to be covered in the next couple of slides, but that's something that is going to be due imminently in the new year. I'm just going to have a break and have a little sip of water for a second. So what's required? So to produce an ACP which sets out the accounting and control system for the qualifying nuclear material in that facility. The accountancy and control plan as required by regulations 7 to 9 of the nuclear safeguards regulations, so NSR 19, must describe in writing the arrangements and procedures adopted or to be adopted because we have had some new um, reporting facilities on by an operator to establish and maintain the system of accountancy and control of qualified nuclear material. And again, you will see the link to the relevant part. Submission of the ACP to ONR should be by the 31st of January 2022. Um, now, those of you that are on from larger facilities, um, you will have already submitted your ACPs. Now, as a result of the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on the operators of the smaller facilities um, and resource available to the majority of the organisations, um, we agreed and recognised that challenges faced by this community um, were not probably proportionate um, and 
we were able to uh, adopt a regulatory approach to implement the ACP requirements a year later. Um, hence them having to send them in January 2022 rather than 2021. So the ACP assessment and inspection for qualified nuclear facilities will be carried out in a proportionate manner as part of our safeguards regulatory framework. Assessment um, of an ACP may undertake a reactive base, maybe sorry, undertaken on a reactive basis by ONR safeguards as part of the UK SSAC. So in other words, if um, you submit your ACP and we feel that um, maybe we haven't got sufficient information, we may come back to you and do an assessment on that ACP to ensure that we've got the information we we require um, and, or it's not providing fundamental safeguards expectations. Reactive assessment will be informed by regulatory intelligence from ONR QNFO inspectors and reporting and intelligence gained from activities or other ONR purposes. Um, there are a lot of the qualified nuclear facilities that are overseen by security and transport. Um, so rather than me or my colleague Stephanie inspecting those qualified nuclear facilities, it may well be that we will ask security and transport to ask a few safeguards questions or just gain oversight um, to gain that regulatory intelligence. Now, ACP compliance inspections may be carried out to sample and inspect the implementation of arrangements for nuclear materials accountancy control and safeguards, so NMAX, as described within the ACP. To guidance capturing ONR's regulatory expectations for accountancy and control plans. Now, at the moment, we have three documents that we would refer you to. Um, and these links have been sent already to all of the smallholders um, or qualifying nuclear facilities of limited operation that have been accepted as Regulation 31 regime. Um, the guidance of the assessment of nuclear material accountancy and control safeguards, so on MAX, this outlines ONR's regulatory expectations for an effective and robust MAX system. It's used by our inspectors to judge the adequacy of the NMAX arrangements as outlined within the ACP and will be applied proportionately based on the qualifying nuclear facility and the quantity, form and use of nuclear material. So to put it in perspective, somebody who is from one of the larger sites or facilities within the UK, it's likely that they would have quite a large document which will cover all sorts of local rules, um, other regulations that they have to comply to. So it could end up being quite a large document. The qualifying nuclear facilities of limited in operation, if they only hold two DU containers, it would not be proportionate for us to expect a very large document from them. So I would only anticipate receiving something of a couple of pages, perhaps used as a pointing reference document out to other um, documents that they may use under the Environment Agency or IIR regulations 2019. Um, we would also suggest that you look at the ONR Safeguards Technical Assessment Guidance. This then gives you an oversight of what we would be looking at when we come and assess and the ONR Safeguards Technical Inspection Guide again something that we would look at if we were coming out to inspect. So it gives you an idea of what our expectations are. So the potential structure of an ACP, so the qualifying or QN flows may wish to consider that the purpose of an ACP is to signpost, underpin and explain how NMAX is being implemented in a manner that is proportionate and appropriate to the qualifying nuclear facility. A functional ACP should ensure relevant stakeholders or operators capture and understand the arrangements and procedures that deliver nuclear materials accountancy and control safeguards as the qualifying nuclear facility. Now, in our safeguards technical assessment guidance, so section five, that provides advice to inspectors and this guidance details the approach to the assessment, which is simplified. And then you also have within the nuclear safeguards regulations at schedule two, 
This provides components of an accountancy and control system, which is referred to in Regulation 6.3. Again, those two links, I think it gives you better interpretation as to what we would expect to see if we come out and inspect or assess you. So the potential structure, it's important to note that the qualifying or QN flow can produce an ACP in whatever structure they wish. And however, the ACP should be usable for the key audience. So your employees who have responsibility for the MLAC system, um, it's become quite relevant, especially in some of our inspections that higher level um, management are not aware of the responsibilities of some of the employees so it's quite good to have um, pointers uh, within the within your ACP which highlight um, who's in charge in management and just to cover the employees as well to ensure that they are aware of your responsibilities um, that if you don't send the reports through at specific times stipulated within the regulations, then you would actually be in non-compliance. Um, so your ACP is there as a guidance document, not just to show us or provide us with a story, but also to help you with your nuclear materials accountancy systems. The ACP should be a useful internal document in therefore um, and should manage sorry to manage and communicate how and why your MMAC system is delivered across the site. So the fundamental safeguards expectations, what we've done is listed these. These are available though um, in the NMAX guidance at page 10. Um, and then after you have examples of or explanations as to what these or what is entailed within these 10 fundamental expectations. So the following expectations should be explained perhaps in a paragraph for each specific specifically for the qualifying nuclear facilities with the limited operation. Um, I wouldn't expect you to provide a huge document, sort of 10 pages for each of these 10 titles, because that's just not proportionate. But we would need you to cover those basic fundamentals. So leadership and management, organisational culture, competence management, reporting, anomalies and investigations, reliability, resilience and sustainability, measurement program and control that is if it's appropriate for you there may be some of these as a smaller facility that are not actually appropriate but we can have discussions um, regarding that once we receive your acp um, nuclear materials tracking data processing and control material balance and quality assurance and control for nuclear material accountancy and control now what we've done here is provided some examples um, so that you can see what our expectations, what the arguments, your argument would be and what the evidence should be. So the first one is an FSC, so fundamental safeguard expectation number three, competence and management. So operators should implement and maintain effective arrangements to manage the competence of those with assigned MMAX roles and responsibilities. So you would look to explain how, so you'd identify the roles and associated MMAX competence requirements for the members of the workforce involved in the operations related to safeguards. This may then be supported by evidence contained within the following. So your company safeguards policy, your R2A2, which roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, authorities. As I mentioned earlier, it, it is quite often overseen or overlooked um, that management should have a role in this. So we should see ACPs listing management, not just the people that do the safeguards reporting. It should actually have oversight from the management. Um, and then training needs analysis and training plans. So we would hope to see that you take up regular training um, within the facility or you'll perhaps have RPAs, RPSs that you would refer to um, for particular areas. The next example is the fundamental safeguards expectation number four, which was reporting anomalies and investigations. So operators must implement and maintain arrangements for the timely and accurate reporting of information required by NSR 19 
arrangements for investigation, resolution and reporting of discrepancies must be in place. So you may look to explain how, so your company organise the management of nuclear materials, you identify, investigate and document the treatment of NMAC anomalies corresponding to NSR, such so regulations 17 and 23. And then this would be supported by evidence contained within the following. So your company, nuclear materials accountancy systems approach in place for usual periodical nuclear material control of movements, measurements and inventory and accidental operations. So i.e. special reports that corresponds to reporting and controlling operations under NSR 19 and your procedure for the treatment of anomalies decision making and implementation of corrective actions. Now something that again um, wasn't necessarily used by smallholders previously um, but should be taken up by the smallholders or qualified nuclear facilities with limited operation is if they have a loss of material or in fact an accidental gain of material um, you can actually report this incident on the ONR info process and or you should rather report this incident um, via this process. So there is a link there um, and it is obviously on our ONR website as well. So please, if you do have any of those, if in doubt, contact us through the UKSO account. Um, but any losses or gains of material or incidents that you feel should be reported as stated within the regulations, um, please use this process. And last but not least, contact the ONR. So as I've, I've said, uh, please use the UKSO account. The main reason for this is so that your emails can be tracked and logged by our uh, divisional support teams and they will then pass it on to the appropriate people, which is normally for the Qualified Nuclear Facilities of Limited Operation, myself as site lead and Stephanie Laverne as my deputy site lead. And last but not least, any questions?